Okay, so let's begin by taking just the simplest possible idea. I'm not looking for perfection here, but we're really talking about the idea. Let's say the light source is coming from here. And this is not a circle, but it's spherical. So if the light source is coming from here, I think I'll take care of the bigger quality first, the biggest tone first, which is this form turning away, turning away from the light source, takes on tone. So if I haven't said this already, I'll say it now. So we're actually using light and tone for the description of form. Let's be real clear about that. The way we're using light and form right now is for the description of form, not for design. We will also be using it for design. But let's keep in mind that what we're discussing now is light and tone for the description of form. We will also be talking about it as a second idea for graphically describing the forms of light and dark because they have their value too. All right, let's go back to this. So we're taking on some tone, and if we get tone going around like this, and if we, at a certain point now, we hit some bounced light coming back from this direction, by the way, this bounce light, as you can see, is directly across from the direct light source. The bounce light is the reflected light. It doesn't have to be directly across. It can be from any direction where you've got a surface that is light enough to carry the light back. In fact, interestingly enough, if it's white, it will reflect white. And if it's some color, it will also pick up some of that color and bring it back in. So if it's hitting a blue surface or a red surface, it will take that color and bring it with it into the reflected area. All right, but since we're working directly with value and, and not color, we don't have to be concerned about that. But I think it's an interesting characteristic of light is that it picks up color as it goes. All right, so... If we get this bounce light, what, what a phenomenon occurs that only happens when you get bounce light called a core shadow. And that core shadow comes in something like this, you see. So what it is, it's a, a, an area between the direct light source and the reflected light source that's darker than both of them. And it's generally soft when the surface turns gently. And it will be harder if the surface turns fast. So if our surface, I can just jump down here for a second. If our surface turns faster, like that, for instance, And our light source, once again, is coming from this direction, right? Then we will hit, okay, we will hit this area right here, see, where you have core shadow, but it'll be harder. Now I'm going to, I'm just going to kind of fill this in. So you get core shadow, but it's a little more severe, a little more intense because the turn is faster. All right. Let's come back to this one in a moment. The other, so what we have is lo, at this point, local tone, core, reflected light, and let's put some cast shadow down here and we'll talk about the characteristics of cast shadow. Just going to do this.
Well, one of the characteristics of cast shadow is, is that it's darkest, closest to the object that's casting the shadow. So you get it darker here, and then it gets lighter as it goes further away from the object that's casting the shadow. Another thing is, is that the edge might be much more articulated, in other words, more focused, when it's closest to the object that's casting the shadow. And that starts, although it becomes light-filled, those edges also begin to soften as we get further and further away. Therefore, the same thing would be true with this object, right? So if we do this, and we cast a shadow in this direction, it will also be darkest here, and it will start to soften as it goes further and further away, like that. And it, 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 it might also broaden, see? So it's not going to say necessarily lined up. All right, so you kind of get that idea about it. All right. How you describe these edges is strictly up to you. You can use line or not. Okay, so we have local tone core reflected light cast shadow. Now, we did talk about, we talked about highlight. And so local tone, like local color, generally has a value to it. And, and therefore, it is not the same value as highlight. Now. When I draw on white paper, I generally combine highlight with local tone. In other words, that's what it would be. I might come in with some half tone in order to show a little bit, and I'll start with that, a little bit of half tone, to show how we can round this out. Very little. And the half tone, remember that the half tone helps us understand how the form is turning away from the light source. It's just a natural way that half tone gives us the local tone's value slightly turned away from the light source. And that's what helps us turn form. We're turning form with these values. All right, so okay, so a little half tone helps us turn this form, and actually we could have a little half tone here. So you notice that one way was for us to leave that completely alone and, and let it stay just local tone, except for the core reflected light cast shadow. Another way is to bring a little half tone in to help turn the form. Right? And what that does is it suggests that the subject's surface is not white. But, it, but its value is uh, down a notch or two from that. So we're suggesting that. Now, having said that, let's look at this as if we wanted to make the local tone 
have a very definite value so that we can see the, the highlight. All right. So we're going to take this now a little bit further, and we'll get the highlight right in here somewhere. Now also notice that when we do this, that this local tone is suggesting to us that this whole surface of this object is darker than we presumed when we did this originally. So I'm going to bring the core down a little deeper and the reflected light also a little more tone like that, see, because of the surface being darker than we first anticipated. So anyway, we start to see this how this works. So now we have reflected light, local tone. There's some half tone in there. Core shadow, reflected light, cast shadow. They all have their characteristics. Remember we talked a little bit about a reflected light and that it can carry color and it will be brighter or dimmer depending on the surface that it's bouncing from. If it's extremely light, that could make this extremely light. The cast shadow has its own characteristics. You remember that it can be very sharp edge near the nearest where the object is closest to the surface it's casting the shadow upon. And it softens, it gets light filled as it goes away. It can also spread out. And its edges are no longer defined clearly. There's, they soften, they fuzz out. And so core shadow will be darker if you get a hard reflected light and your light, direct light that's hitting the surface is also strong. And if we said if our, our, our object has a certain value to it, to say on a scale of one to 10, it's two or three or four, then that tone will be perceived against the highlight that might be there depending on how shiny the surface is. If it's very shiny, it can be look like chrome. If it's soft, then it might look something like this. I'm suggesting, though, that it's possible, if we're working on white paper, to take the highlight and the local tone is one. And so, therefore, we would have Local tone, core reflected light, cast shadow, four things instead of five, which would include highlight. Okay. And the other thing, once again, when the object turns quickly, you're going to get a, a more confined, restricted core, and it's going to be denser. It will also be denser if, as I said, if the light that hits this surface, the bounce light that hits this surface, is lighter. The light, lighter that is, the stronger that will be, the core shadow. Okay, let me also give you some possible examples, just real sketches over here. Maybe early Renaissance from the time of Giotto, the form might have been something more like this, where 
somewhat the center of the form might have been the way form was described. Say something like this. And then kind of a, you know, a cast shadow, nonetheless. Now this is an interesting thing because this, this form of lighting an object is something we're going to come back to when we talk about the secondary light source. See, it lends itself to that to some degree. All right. Okay. Say, along comes Michelangelo, and you get this. I'll do this more quickly now. Okay, so you'll notice that this is strong. We get local tone core reflected light cast shadow. We get to say Caravaggio and you're going to get something like this where we hardly see the reflected light at all. Cast shadow, strong. Core shadow, strong. But we're not seeing a lot of light in the reflected light area. It's a very strong abstract relationship between lights and darks. And Let's take Tiepolo here. Tiepolo, on the other hand, a lot of his work was murals on ceilings and domed ceilings and so on. So a lot of his figures up there were up in the clouds. And he was still using the same concepts of light and tone that Michelangelo used, but he had his own way of doing it. Now, he wanted to, his figures to feel like they were very light. Well, when we think about the way a figure might be lit up in the sky, you've got all kinds of bounce light. And, and so there really aren't going to be any core shadows in the rest of it. You've got light coming from every direction. It's probably going to neutralize an awful lot of the effect of light, unless someone's in the middle of the air and directly getting a light source. But if they're in the clouds, it's going to be bouncing around all over the place. But in Tiepolo's case, he stuck to this system of core light. So he would come along and do, say, something like this and create, you know, an, kind of an accent here. And this would be practically as light, if not as light, as what you see on the direct light side. So the, the basic difference between the two would sometimes only be perceived with color. For instance, this might be warmer or pinker, and this might be cooler or bluer, very, very subtly. So he's working a lot on the, the expression of the way this ribbon of core shadow runs through the figure and the accents where the flesh tucks or moves into another, another part of the body or something. You get these little accents along the way, which are actually little cast shadows, but they're not really long. It doesn't make long cast shadows. Just enough to show that the form is still turning. So, okay. So these are some ways that we can think about this. And once, a, once again, what I started with here was a simple Michelangelo approach, which is local tone, core, reflected light, cast shadow. Then we added, if you remember, we added some half tone, and then we went further and made the local tone darker. So it still has its half tone effect. In other words, it's turning away from the light source. And we have a highlight. Okay, now let's 
at this point, let's look at, at a couple of other things that are possible here. If, for instance, and this, these, these things occur, so I'm going to bring them up. Let's take this same object now, or this same surface, and look at it this way, except this time, let's, let's make this edge the direction that the light is hitting. So that means that both, both surfaces moving away from that edge, let me see if I can move this. Both surfaces moving away from that edge take on tone. So as we move away from that and we move away from this surface, they take on more and more tone. That means that the edge that the edge has the light instead of the dark. Now, where might you find things that would do something like that? Well, one place, for instance, let's just do this. One place, let's just give a little tone, 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 is right here across this cheekbone. So, this might even have some tone in here, a little tone, a little tone, there might be some here, some here, and let's just say the jaw is coming down. Could even be a little tone here and so on. And let's. All right. Let's just kind of knock that in, see. Okay, right here. See, and then you were getting some reflected light in this area, see. All right. Right here. That's the concept. So that's an example of it and where you might be able to use it, okay? All right. Okay. I know that's a little fuzzy, but I think we could keep working on that, but I think my point is made. Okay. Now, I also now want to talk a little bit about half tones. And let's see if we can do it down here in this quadrant. A little bit about half tones. Let's see how we're going to do this. Something like that. Okay, this is going here. And we want this here. All right, something like that. Okay. You're going to see, uh, now if we have a, a light source, for instance, that's coming 
more or less directly overhead. That's overhead on every part of this, right? Then as this, as, then obviously the surface that faces this is going to have the most light. And therefore, as the surface turns away, it takes on more and more tone. So this will take on more and more tone like this. And it's a kind of steady movement away. So it should be, say, something like that. I'm giving you this rather quickly. Obviously, underneath here is going to be some cast shadow, right? This is, this is not so much what I'm concerned about you understanding. What I'm thinking about is this right here. This is a possibility. Uh, this is something that you'll run into over and over and over again when dealing with the forms. The next might be, say, something like this, where, again, the light source, keep, keep this in mind, is hitting the top surface. And so this takes on more and more tone as it comes down here. By the way, this is also directly facing the light source. So it's going to be just as light as that. It's not so far back. If this were a mile back, it might have some atmosphere in front of it. If these were mountains, then maybe down in the valley, it might have some tone, some fog, whatever, some atmosphere. But at this distance, the way we're describing it, this surface and this surface will be equally light, right? In the case of the face, though, you see this is turning away. It's going to take on some tone. Even this area might have more tone than this area, okay? Direct light, but this is starting to turn away. I haven't gone into that much of a description here, but you can see what I'm talking about. All right. Now, as this turns away, it gets, it starts very light, and then it gets darker and darker until it hits an edge. And then, uh, in addition, there might be a little bit of cast shadow because this is coming around and going away and tucking away from the light source, right? Again, we'll have some tone under here. Like this. Not too concerned about that again. The major thing that I'm emphasizing is these two different ways. So we could say, mm, that's B. All right. The third thing that you're likely to encounter is a light surface being hit, but it turns away from the light source on both sides. Again, here you're going to get a little cast shadow, maybe a little more. Possibly a little more. Yeah, okay. And we'll call that C. One, two, three, A, B, C. But those are three different scenarios that you're likely to encounter over and over again when you're working with the figure. One form turning into another form. And when we actually look at some of the old masters together and how they use these light sources, which will uh, come up in the demonstration, you'll see examples of all three of these again and again. You'll see examples of any one of these things, depending on which which artist we look at. You'll see this, you'll see this. And, and you'll also, and this is, this is all basically related to the first idea about light, which is a single 
direct light source. Incidentally, I said it was conceptual, even though we were talking about the second one, center of the form gets the light, as being a conceptual. I'm saying that the first one is conceptual too. And, and this is why you have to imagine a different kind of world when you think about the Renaissance when these ideas were first conceived. Not in the earliest part of the Renaissance, but around Michelangelo's time, when these ideas were conceived. They had to think about a direct light source and what it does. That means they observed it, but it also wasn't produced by the same kind of electricity that we're using today. It was produced by something, an object that, that moved, or at least perceivably moved, and that's the sun. Sun was obviously going around the earth, right? Well, As the sun moved and rose and went down, it would constantly be changing its relationship to the objects it was casting its light upon. So one had to work at all times of the day, not just the the moment which was the uh, best possible moment for their light source. So that meant that they had to understand what the light was doing. So they actually had to think about these same concepts and come up with these concepts about light. And that's what I mean that it becomes conceptual once it's understood and that you could use that light source on three-dimensional objects. That's why I'm saying volumes, that you can use it on there. And, if you, and to understand that if you can create volumes, then you can light them is an idea that you can, you can actually take home. You don't need to wait for the sun to be in the right place. You can create the conditions in your mind's eye, therefore conceptual, using conceptual ideas to work with the figure and with light and so on, is basically what they became very masterful at. And, and so I'm referring to it as a, a single light, a direct light source, because they, were, they could be very specific about that. Now. Imagine that they're studios, and I I think that the whole concept about north light, we all say, oh, north light's the best light. Well, I think the reason that north light was considered to be the best light was because you had less of this movement of the sun changing everything within the studio uh, if it was in the north than if it was in the south. Because the south is essentially in the northern hemisphere, is where the sun seems to be crossing our path. And in the north, we're getting basically a kind of an ambient light that comes in that's less intrusive in the sense that it's not making radical changes minute by minute. Imagine that the Renaissance started in the Mediterranean, in Italy, and The light was very, very distinctive and very strong and very passionate and purposeful and all the rest of it, you know, so that it had these strong characteristics, but it also moved on. So how to corral that, how to organize that, to structure it so that you could actually ride that horse and use it as a way of structuring your pictures. And and so they thought about these things. And they came up with these ideas that they began to share with everyone else that was interested. And, you know, it's like, a, in a way, it's, it's, it's like a soft technology, technology that, that the mind created and, and therefore was shared. And a light perspective, which was created around that time, too, it just spread across the, the, the whole spectrum of thought for those that were interested in this. Empower your creativity with the Internet's leading subscription library for artists at nma.art. No matter what your skill level, you can learn drawing, painting, sculpture, and much more with thousands of videos taught by master instructors. Our instructors are professional artists and best-selling authors, leading art education with over 40 books in print around the world. 
Our cutting-edge interactive learning format takes art instruction to a new level. Learn at your own pace, anytime, anywhere. Take advantage of our self-study assignments and beautiful references to practice your artistic skills. Our mission is to provide exceptional training to artists around the world at an affordable price. Thousands of artists just like you have used our library to take the first step into the art world, open new career possibilities and improve their professional skills. NMA.art is the most comprehensive art training on the internet. Your subscription is everything you need to reach your artistic goals. Let us transform your art and unleash your creative potential. Start your free trial today at nma.art.